Dr. Jeff Frost is uh, with us today from the Alberta Neurologic Center, uh, and he also works at the South Health Campus Neuromuscular Clinic. Uh, Dr. Jeff is a dynamic individual whose journey brings together medicine and engineering. He completed his undergraduate and master's degree in university, uh, sorry, in engineering at the University of Toronto. After spending some time as an engineer, he ventured into the operating room at the Toronto General Hospital, and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, since his time in Toronto, he has spent his life work, his work life, <laughs> I don't know why I'm stumbling so much today, his work life uh, between biomedical engineering startups and his medical career. He completed his medical degree at McMaster University and then moved across the country to do his residency in physiatry at the University of Alberta. For Jeff, physiatry is a perfect match with his interests in both engineering and medicine. Uh, Jeff continues to live, live a, double, oh my gosh, a double life as both a physician and an engineer. As a, as a physician, he focuses on the intricacies of nerve and muscle problems. As an engineer, his latest project is all about helping children with spinal muscular atrophy enjoy physical play. When not at work, uh, Jeff loves a good board game, playing hockey, going for hikes, and skiing in the mountains. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that lovely introduction, Linda. I'll just, uh, one quick point of clarification. I actually did my residency at the University of British Columbia and then did a fellowship here in Alberta. So I've been all over the country, but okay, yeah. Yes, and then, <laughs> I am now a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at the University of Calgary, which uh, I am supposed to say at the start of these presentations, but uh, most of my time these days is spent in the clinic, seeing patients, which is what I enjoy doing the most. So today we're going to talk about EMG. What is it? How does it work? Why do, you, why do we use it? And what does it mean when you go for an EMG test? And I know everyone who has been considered for a diagnosis of a neuropathy at some point has probably had an EMG test, and maybe it's something you'd like to learn more about. So I hope we can explore that together today. And I'm just going to, there we go. So before I get started, I always like to make some disclosures just so you know if there's any financial incentives that could be swaying some of the things that I'm saying today. And directly really related to this talk, I have no relevant financial disclosures. I don't get paid to do this talk. I'm very proud to support the work of the CNA without any, without any financial incentive. I do have some other disclosures that are unrelated to this talk, just so you guys all know. I do also do some treatments in an, an area of medicine called spasticity management or spasticity treatment, and I have some relevant disclosures there, but we're not gonna talk about anything spasticity related today. So I felt these disclosures were not material to our presentation today. Okay, <clears throat> just in terms of setting the stage, I know Linda already went over a couple of these things, but I think it's always great to just talk about them together. So we're gonna be doing some group-based learning today. So we're gonna be talking about the basics of electrodiagnostic medicine. And while we will discuss a fictional case, no part of today's talk should be construed as direct medical advice for participants in today's session. Put another way, I am a doctor, but for the context of today's presentation, I am not your doctor. And I know that might be hard for some of you to understand because you are my patients, but try and remember for today's talk, we're just, we're just speaking at a high level towards everyone, not towards an individual. The other thing just as is worth bringing up is I know your next speaker next month will be coming from a different tradition. Um, I've been trained in evidence-based medicine or Western-based medicine, and I'm gonna be talking about EMG or electrodiagnostics in the context of evidence-based medicine. There are other medical traditions like naturopathy, but I won't be exploring these today and I won't be able to answer questions about these as it's outside of my scope of expertise. And just in terms of questions, they are welcome throughout the presentation. I know Donna, uh, our wonderful assistant here at the Alberta Medical uh, Center, will, or sorry, Alberta Neurologic Center, will be looking through the chat and she'll let me know if uh, there's a question that needs answering here. So with all that out of the way, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about today. So in terms of objectives, I just like to talk about what electrodiagnostic testing is. Throughout the presentation, we're gonna take some detours into relevant anatomy that might help us better understand the big words we use like electrodiagnostic medicine and electrodiagnostic testing. We're gonna review what electrodiagnostic testing assesses. We're gonna talk about how electrodiagnostic testing informs physicians about the health of your nerves. 
And then we're also going to be, we're going to talk about how we use electrodiagnostic medicine to make diagnoses in modern medicine. So one other quick point on visual language. I'm really into colors. I hope no one here is colorblind. Uh, but when you see anything in red, that's signifying a key definition that's really important to understanding today's talk. So try not to forget the words written in red and what they mean. If I write anything in green, that's because this is a, a real clinical pearl. And what I mean by that is something that you can hold on to so that you can better understand a conversation with a physician or with a healthcare provider about your nerve health. And then when I highlight things in pink, this is a really important anatomy fact. If you can remember it, it would be great. To be honest, I often say that my job really comes down to being an applied anatomist. I have to know human anatomy really, really well, whether that's nerves, muscles, bones, and then applying that anatomy to each individual patient's case. So I've tried to highlight some important anatomy that might help you understand nerves and nerve testing today. I do know it's a lot to memorize. It took me many years to memorize all this. I certainly don't expect anyone to remember the anatomy facts today, but yeah, it can help. Okay, in terms of electrodiagnostic testing. So what is electrodiagnostic testing? That's the first question I often get asked when patients come see me in clinic. So at a high level, electrodiagnostic testing is a suite of medical tests that can be used to evaluate nerve function in the human body. When we use electrodiagnostic testing appropriately, it allows us to diagnose and then suggest treatments for specific nerve problems that can happen in the human body. And here you can see our wonderful technologist, Tristan, who works at Alberta Neurologic Center, and she's doing an electrodiagnostic test. I think this might be on me. It might be a patient. I'm not sure. Um, and <laughs> she's just showing us the, the equipment that we use to do electrodiagnostic testing. Now, here's Toothless from one of my all-time favorite movies, How to Train Your Dragon. And Toothless here is looking very confused, as I suspect some of you may be because I keep using the word electrodiagnostic testing or electrodiagnostic medicine. But many people often say, but I thought it was called an EMG. You know, my doctor says they're sending me for an EMG. And then when you call the clinic, they'll talk about the time for your EMG appointment. And really this comes down to a mistake in naming. And it's a mistake we as physicians have made. I'm not really sure what happened, how we got messed up along the way. But when we talk about testing human nerves, we really should say we're doing an electrodiagnostic test. EMG or electromyography is one small part of an electrodiagnostic test. But most patients who come in for an electrodiagnostic test don't even get an EMG. An EMG is like a subsection of EDX that not everybody does. So because this is an academic talk today, I'm gonna to be using the correct words. So I'm gonna call this electrodiagnostic testing or EDX. I won't be calling it EMG. And to give you an analogy, EMG, it's one small part of an electrodiagnostic test. So calling an electrodiagnostic test an EMG is almost like calling a tree a leaf. It's not really the right word. And everyone always asks me, well, how did this happen? I, I honestly don't know. Um, and I just see here is a nerve conduction study, another name for this technology. It is not a nerve conduction study, just like EMG is a small subsection of the electrodiagnostic test. But don't worry, Angela, we're going to go over that in detail. Um, all righty. So moving on, now that we got that out of the way, we're going to take a quick detour into some human anatomy. So the number one thing we need to know about human anatomy before we go any further is what is a nerve? So a nerve is a group of specialized cells in the human body that transmit information in the form of electrochemical energy. So nerves send information from one end of the nerve to the other end of the nerve. And all the nerves in our arms and our legs are oriented in one direction. They either send information away from the brain or they send information to the brain. So if a nerve sends information towards the brain, that information is arriving at the brain, so it's an afferent nerve. If the information travels away from the brain, it's exiting the brain, and so that's an efferent nerve. These are kind of important anatomy terms that get thrown around, but if I were to tell you what's the most important thing for you to remember from this slide, it's just what is a nerve? A nerve is a group of specialized cells that transmit information from one end of the nerve to the other, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And that's what electrodiagnostic tests, electrodiagnostic testing tests. It tests how well the nerves in your body are working. The other big thing we need to talk about is the big 
the two big parts of the nervous system in the human body. So the human body's nervous system can be divided into two big groups. The first group is called the central nervous system. So this is the brain and your spinal cord. This is something that's deep inside your body. It's really well protected. And frankly, it's quite hard to test. What we test with our electrodiagnostic testing is the peripheral nervous system. So these are the nerves in your arms, your legs, and your chest. So electrodiagnostic testing only tests peripheral nerves, nerves in your arms and legs. So what's the big thing to remember here? With our electrodiagnostic, electrodiagnostic testing, we can test nerves in the arms and the legs. All righty, so that's our first step in anatomy. But let's go back to the definition of electrodiagnostic testing, because now that we know we're testing nerves, what did that first definition mean? Well, an electrodiagnostic study or an electrodiagnostic test is a suite of medical tests that use sensors to listen to the flow of electrochemical energy in your nerves, in your arms, and your legs. So we're looking at how well your body can send information up and down your nerves. By listening very carefully and looking very carefully at how that information flows up and down your arms and legs, physicians can see patterns which may suggest a diagnosis. And depending on the diagnosis, we may be able to suggest treatments for nerve problems in your body. So really an electrodiagnostic test listens to how well information flows up and down your nerves. So, We've, we talked about electrodiagnostic testing being made up of multiple little parts. Well, what are those little parts? There's three, I guess, four main test modes that we use in electrodiagnostic testing to understand the health of your nerves. They provide us with lots of information about nerves, about muscles, and even about the junction between the nerves and the muscles. So we're going to talk about all four of these key parts, but just at a very high level, what are they? Well, the first part is the history and physical examination. So that's when you talk to the doctor and the doctor does a physical exam. Believe it or not, the physical exam is really important in EDX or electrodiagnostic testing. When I see a patient, I really rely on that physical exam to make sure that the results from the rest of the test all make sense. After we do our physical examination and history, every patient, pretty much every patient gets a nerve conduction study. And we're gonna talk about what that is. Depending on what the first two show, you may need an electromyography or EMG test, and you may also need a repetitive nerve stimulation or RNS test. So these are three different little subcomponents of the electrodiagnostic exam. Now I should say there's actually way more than just these, these four. There's things like blink reflexes, we can even do H reflexes, we can do F waves, tons of other little tests that all make up the electrodiagnostic medicine toolkit. Today, we're gonna to talk about really these two, nerve conduction studies and electromyography, because those are the big two that pretty much every patient has experience with. Some people get repetitive nerve stimulation. The other kind of testing that I mentioned, like F waves, H reflexes, stuff like that, they aren't done very often, so I won't be talking about those today. Okay, so in terms of nerve conduction studies, what are they? Well, nerve conduction studies test the function of your sensory nerves and your motor nerves. It works by sending short pulses of electricity through your nerves. We like quite literally take a little stimulator, send a zap of electricity through your skin into your nerve, that electricity travels down your nerve, and then we see what happens by attaching some sensors to your body. Those sensors, which are just stickers, if you've ever had an, EM or an electrodiagnostic testing done, those stickers measure the amount of electrical flow in your body. If voltage goes up, voltage goes down, that's what we use to determine how well those nerves are sending energy, both, or sorry, sending information, both up and down the nerve. The big things we record is how fast your nerve sends information and how much information your nerve sends. In terms of the equipment we use, we start with a stimulator. So that's that little white thing you can see here. This is what the technologist holds. They zap your arm and it sends a little jolt of electricity through your skin and into your nerves. We then have electrodes, which are stickers. Those are placed over muscles or nerves in your body, and they record what happens when we send jolts of electricity through the stimulator and through your nerves. And then there's a computer, and the computer collects all the information from the electrodes, and it presents that information to the physician and the technologist in a readable format so that they can understand how well your nerves are working. 
So next up, we have what it actually feels like. So what does it feel like when you get a nerve conduction study? Well, if you get a nerve conduction study done in the hospital or at the Alberta Neurologic Center, you'll actually be seen by a technologist first. So the technologist starts by greeting you. They'll clean your skin with alcohol, and we clean everybody's skin with alcohol because it allows the test to work better so that we get better results. They'll then measure distances on your body. They'll take out a little tape measure, and they'll measure things like how long your nerve is in your arm, how long your nerve is in your hand, and they might even make marks on your skin with a pen. They'll then put some stickers on certain parts of your body. Again, we always put the stickers over nerves or over muscles because those are the things we're measuring. And then they'll use that stimulator to send small jolts of electricity into your nerves through the skin. Now, this is the big point of contention that everybody likes to talk about. When we send the jolts of electricity into your nerves, it can be uncomfortable. It's not dangerous. It doesn't damage the nerves. But if you've ever had this done, it doesn't feel great. And I like to tell everyone this story, when we're in training, we get this test done to ourselves so that we know what patients feel when they come get our testing. And I have yet to see anyone be as much of a wimp as I was. Every time I've had this test done to me, I yelp and scream and jump around. I really dislike it. And so when a patient tells me that they don't like the test, I understand. I also do not like the test. It's not a very fun time for me, but most people get through it just fine. Oh, I see one question here about small fiber. Angela, hold on to that. We are going to talk about small fiber and large fiber nerves later in the talk. All right. So nerve conduction studies, when it comes to the details, what are we doing? Well, like I said, we want to look at how well information travels in your nerves. So the first thing we measure is how much information travels in the nerves, and that's called amplitude. So when we send a jolt of electricity through the nerve, say here we stimulate your nerve at what the, the diagram here shows as S2, that signal travels down the nerve and gets to this muscle, which is R on, in our picture here. And when that, when that jolt of electricity gets to R, we see how much electricity makes it. And the amount of electricity that makes it, that's our amplitude. That tells us how much information gets sent down the nerve. There are certain toxins, things like lead is a really good example. This is why we don't have lead water pipes anymore. Lead tends to attack motor nerves. So it goes after nerves and it unfortunately kills them off. And what happens when we do our nerve conduction studies is that we see small amplitudes. We see tiny waves because nerves have been killed off by the lead. And so one of the things we're looking for when we do nerve conduction studies is we're trying to see how much information gets sent. If there isn't much information being sent, that tells us that there's a specific kind of nerve problem going on, a nerve problem that attacks the nerve itself. The next thing we measure is how fast information travels. Now that's called the conduction velocity. So basically, does the, does the information move very quickly or very slowly down the nerve? Now, like we said here, most variants of Charcot-Marie tooth disease, not all, but most variants, result in nerves that send information very slowly. They still send the right amount, the amplitude, so the size of information is, is correct, but it sends the amplitude, or sorry, it sends the information very slowly. And you can see that in the diagram here where we've got one nerve that's sending information really quickly, so it's got a short peak latency, and another nerve here has got a long proximal or onset latency, even though the amplitude is about the same. So, if a nerve sends information slowly, we worry about the conduction velocity. So the big things to remember, how much energy are you sending? What's the amplitude? And how fast are you sending that information? What's the conduction, conduction velocity? And we are going to talk about EMG needles later, but that's when we get to EMG. Today, just so far, we're just talking about nerve conduction studies. So before we go any further with nerve conduction studies, let's talk about nerves some more from an anatomical perspective. So again, what's the point of a nerve? Like, why does the human body have nerves? We have nerves so that we can send information throughout the body. These really are the wires of the human body. And we send information from our arms and our legs up to our brain. And we also send information from our brain down into our hands and our feet. And you can really think of nerves just like wires. Wires send information from one end to the other. And just like a wire, a nerve has a protective coating. 
In the human nerve, that's called myelin, and we're going to talk about that in a bit more in a second. But it's just important to remember that nerves send information from one end to the other, and they have a protective coating, just like a real wire. Now, what does it look like when a nerve sends information down the length of, down the, length of the nerve? Well, there's this very complicated electrical, electrochemical process that we're not going to go into today because it's not really important to know the, the whole you know, science textbook level detail. But what I think is worth remembering is that when you start a nerve impulse, which in our diagram here is shown by someone stepping on this balloon, it creates a wave of information. And that wave of information travels down the length of the nerve. So in our diagram here, this, this, this guy's stepping on the balloon and that creates a wave of pressure that travels down the nerve. In the human nerve, once a little impulse gets sent, there's a wave of electrical electrochemical energy that travels all the way down the nerve. So it goes from one end of the nerve all the way to the other. And that's how we send information. It's a wave of electrochemical energy down the length of the nerve. So, like I said, just like a wire, it has protective coating. And here we see, uh, sorry, I just want to go over a, what is a nerve, what is a fascicle, what is a neuron. Um, so I've been using the term nerve. A nerve is technically a group of fascicles. And you might be sitting there going, well, hey, what the heck? You haven't told us what that is. What's a fascicle? Well, a fascicle is a group of neurons, which leads to the question of, well, what's a neuron? And a neuron is the smallest functional unit within a nerve. If Again, if we're going to be comparing nerves to wires, you can think of a neuron as a single strand of metal. Just like wires are made up of multiple strands of metal that are all wrapped together and then covered in a protective coating, a neuron is a single strand of metal. It's a single little functional unit that sends information down the length of it. You can group all those neurons together into little bundles called fascicles. And then you can group the fascicles together. And when you group fascicles together, you get a nerve. So what does this mean fun What does this mean practically? Well, it means there's a lot of redundancy in your body. Because if you talk about a nerve that, say, starts in your neck, travels all the way down your arm, and connects to a muscle in your hand, that nerve has many thousands of little neurons in it. And those tiny little neurons are all sending information in the same direction. They're going from your brain down to your hand. And we have thousands of little neurons all doing the same thing in case there's damage to some of those neurons. Say five of the thousand neurons get damaged. Well, that's okay. We still have 995 neurons sending information down the nerve. And that leads to this big conclusion here, which is the more neurons a nerve has, the more information it can send. If we lose neurons because of a problem in the nerve, we'll send less information. And again, what was the word for sending information? It's called amplitude. So the more neurons you have, the bigger the amplitude of the wave at the end. The less neurons you have, the smaller the amplitude of the wave. So I just see one question here, which I'm gonna look, what causes nerves to die off in the feet and what's being done for nerve regeneration? Okay, well, there's many different things that cause nerves to die off in the feet. We'll talk a little about that when we do our clinical case at the end. In terms of nerve regeneration, where we have lots of clinical trials that are uh, ongoing, but the short answer, unfortunately, is so far, none of our medications have really panned out. Nerves, when they get damaged, are very challenging and very difficult to regrow. The best tool we have for regrowth of nerves is time. Your nerves will regrow by themselves, if, we, if given enough time and if put in the right environment. Um, but we don't have, unfortunately, any medicines or any therapies that have proven we can speed that up. I know sometimes you'll Google things on the internet and they'll suggest that they're good for nerve regeneration, but um, from everything we've been able to test in rigorous scientific studies, nerve regeneration is very challenging and we don't really have a good medicine to encourage nerve regeneration. I know that's not what we want to hear, and I, I honestly wish I had a different answer, but that's just kind of the state of modern medicine as it is. Back to anatomy. I do want to spend a few more seconds here on the neuron. So what is the neuron? The neuron, as I mentioned, it's the smallest functional unit of the nerve. It's a tiny individual cell that can send information from one end of the nerve to the other. An important thing to know is this word axon. We use the word axon to refer to this long, slender part of the nerve, basically the, bi the business part of the nerve, the part of the nerve that sends information 
from one end of the nerve to the other. Now, axons are very long, they're very skinny, and it's what transmits information down the nerve. But then there's also this stuff called myelin, and that's the blue stuff in this picture. So myelin is a protective coating that surrounds the nerve and leaves tiny little gaps. By leaving tiny little gaps, it actually A, protects the nerve, but B, it also speeds up how quickly a nerve can send information down the length of it. Now, myelin is actually made up of different cells. So the neuron is one cell, and then the myelin sheath is made up of many, many little tiny cells that wrap themselves around the axon. You can think of them as like good buddies that work together to make a better situation than either one could do by themselves. And then we have this thing called saltatory conduction. This gets really confusing quickly. I never even fully understood it when I was a medical student, but at a very high level, what does myelin do? Well, myelin creates these little blockages in nerve transmission. So remember, we are sending an impulse from one end of the nerve to the other. By creating these blockages in transmission, we actually speed up how quickly that information travels down the nerve. Remember before when this guy stood on the balloon, it slowly pushed a pressure wave down the entire balloon. In this situation, when we have myelin blocking points of neuromuscular junction transmission, what happens to that pressure wave is it bounces from one hole in the myelin sheath to another. So it bounces down the holes. Instead of traveling down the entire nerve, it bounces down the holes. And the net function of that is that you get faster transmission down the nerve. So your nerve moves information more quickly when it's covered in myelin. That means that if a nerve is no longer covered in myelin, it will send information very slowly. And that's something that we're testing for when we do our nerve conduction studies. So if I were to boil this little anatomy detour down to the basic facts, what do we have here? Well, nerves, nerves are like wires. They send information from one end of the neuron to the other, from one end of the nerve to the other. Nerves are groupings of little cells that are called neurons. So a nerve is thousands of little neurons all grouped together, just like a wire is thousands of strands of metal all grouped together. The amount of information a nerve can send is largely dependent on how many neurons are bundled together. The more neurons you have, the bigger amplitude you'll get, the more information you're sending down the length of that nerve. How fast a nerve sends information is largely determined by whether or not it's covered in myelin. There's a few other factors at play, but the big one that I always talk about is myelin. So the more myelin you have on your nerves, the faster the nerves will send information. So how much information you send is determined by how many neurons you have. How fast you send that information is determined by how much myelin you have covering your nerve. So the question, I see another question here, can nerves be stopped from dying off? Uh, and that really depends on what's causing the dying, Michael. So um, there are some medical conditions that can cause nerves to die off. Some of them are treatable. If we treat the underlying medical condition, that can prevent nerves from dying off. However, every human being, once you get into the third decade of life, so that means once you get into like your mid-20s, will start losing a certain number of neurons per year. It's about 1% or 2% per year. And unfortunately, that's just normal human aging. As we age, some of these neurons die off. And there really isn't anything we can do about age-related neuron loss. We can do something about neuron loss if it's related to a medical condition that's treatable. So a really good example of this is diabetes or low thyroid. Low thyroid or hypothyroidism can bother nerves. Nerves are very, very sensitive. I like to call them snowflakes because if you put a nerve in a situation it doesn't like, it starts acting in wonky ways and unfortunately sometimes it can die off. And low thyroid is a state that bothers nerves. Low, low thyroid hormone is a state that bothers nerves and sometimes can lead to nerves dying off. So one thing we can do if you have low thyroid is replace your thyroid so that thyroid level comes back to normal and that can prevent nerves from dying off. And there are many, many other health conditions like this. I would, I would take me a whole hour to list all the different medical conditions we know of that can lead to nerves dying off. And so that's part of why people come for electrodiagnostic testing is A, we try and see what's going on with your nerve and then B, if there is something going on with your nerve, what's causing that? And is it a reversible cause of nerve damage? So I hope that answers your question, Michael.
All right. Back to nerve conduction studies. So, okay, what does conduction velocity and amplitude mean? How do we do this in a very, how do we, how do we interpret all this information? So, like I said, amplitude is how much energy or, and how much information gets sent down your, down your nerves. So, a disease that leads to low amplitude is a disease that causes a die-off of axons or a die-off of neurons. And we call, call these axonal diseases. So one of the reasons you get a nerve conduction study is to see whether or not the amplitude of your nerves is within normal ranges. If it's not, we worry about something called an axonal nerve disease. And we try and look for causes of that and treat it if we can find one. The next thing we look at when we do your nerve conduction studies is we look at how fast your nerve sends information. So what's the conduction velocity of your nerves? And if your nerve has enough of a myelin coating, you'll send information quickly. And if not, you may not have enough of a myelin coat. Now, these diseases we call demyelinating diseases because we've lost the myelin. So if you've lost your myelin, again, we think of things that might cause this, and we try and find ways to treat it if we can. So going back to our electrodiagnostic test, we talked about a history and physical examination, and then we talked about nerve conduction studies. We use nerve conduction studies to test for conduction velocity or demyelinating diseases, and we test for amplitude or axonal diseases. So these two, the history and physical examination and the nerve conduction study, really do form the core of our electrodiagnostic examination. For most patients, I say 70% of patients, we can figure out what's going on by doing the history and physical examination and the nerve conduction study. So for most people who have had this test done, your test will end here. It will stop after stage two. And I know you might be thinking, hang on a second. If it's going to stop after stage stage two here, stage one nerve conduction studies, as I've written here, well, I guess this, I guess we don't. We can end the talk since this is what most people get. Seventy percent of people just get the history, the physical, the nerve conduction studies. We can probably just all call it a day here. But there are a few other things that can that we do test, like the the uh, EMG and the repetitive nerve stimulation. And I'll just talk about those briefly today so that we can try and better understand them. But before I go on to EMG, I'm just going to quickly read these questions here. Is it myelin that constricts to cause stenosis? No, it's, uh, so Margo, this is your question. No, myelin does not cause stenosis. So stenosis is what Mar Margo's talking about there. That's when um, a, a hole through which a nerve travels, the nerves travel through lots of different holes in your body as they go from your spinal cord down to your muscles or from your sensory organs in your hands and fingers all the way up to the spine. As they, the holes they travel through, if those holes get tight, we call that stenosis. Stenosis almost always occurs right at the spine. So where the spinal cord is, it gives off some nerves and it gives off those nerves that travel into your arms and your legs. As it gives off those nerves, it has to go through a hole in your spine. And generally, stenosis refers to changing of the hole in your spine, tightening of the hole. And as that hole tightens, it squishes on the nerve. So the nerve isn't able to exit the spinal cord in a healthy, safe way. And we call that stenosis or a radiculopathy. Okay, Kimmy, Kim, Kimala Clark, what research has been done for neuropathy caused from COVID and vaccine injury or long COVID and possible treatment? Yeah, you know, so I'm going to, just rephrase that question a little. We have known about nerve injury as a result of viral infections for some time now. I know in the context of COVID, it became a really hot topic, um, but we have seen nerve injury in the context of viral, in viral infections for as long as we have known about nerves and as long as we have known about viruses. Um, so, um, is it a surprise to me that we saw more injuries, some, sorry, nerve injuries in the context of a global pandemic? Not at all. And uh, we've tested many patients who have presented with nerve injuries as a result of the COVID pandemic. With respect to vaccination, that actually is a known risk factor. There are some vaccines do cause nerve injury, but the rate of vaccine of nerve injury due to vaccines is almost always, for all the vaccines that have been approved for use in humans, the rate of nerve injury is much lower than the rate of nerve injury due to the actual disease itself. So COVID is a great example of this. I don't have these numbers off the top of my head, so I apologize. But, you know, for the sake of discussion, you can say that one in 100 people might get a nerve injury from COVID and maybe one in 10,000 would get a nerve injury from vaccination. So both are risk factors for nerve injuries. 
but they're very uh, they're very rare uh, complications, and we do test for patients if they present with them. Okay. All right, so I'm going to quickly answer Leah's question. Having GBS or Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, how does EMG assist? Well, Guillain-Barre depends on the type of Guillain-Barre. There's both axonal and demyelinating forms of Guillain-Barre. So we do the nerve conduction studies to test for how much information your nerve sends, so the amplitude, and how fast you send information, so that's the conduction velocity. In patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome, we see a change, and then we can monitor that amplitude and that conduction velocity over time to monitor for improvement. Every physician's a little different. I typically test my GBS patients every six months, and that's a way of telling whether or not they've gotten better. Okay, Betty Lou asks, can myofascial pain syndrome cause hypertonicity of muscles and impact nerve function? Generally, myofascial pain syndrome does not present with changes on an electrodiagnostic test, Betty Lou. It does present with a bunch of symptoms, which can be very bothersome, but if you go get an electrodiagnostic test done, most people will tell you that the electrodiagnostic test was normal. If the electrodiagnostic test was abnormal, that would suggest a diagnosis other than myofascial pain syndrome. Okay. Ann Russell asks, when the myelin sheath is compromised by Charcot-Marie tooth disease, causing muscles to tighten, lack of balance and pain, what can nerve conduction test do? So, and that basically what the nerve conduction test does is it quantifies what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with, a dam are we dealing with damage to myelin, a demyelinating disease? Are we dealing with damage to the nerve, an axonal disease? and how much damage has occurred. That allows us to better understand what therapies might be useful and what your clinical course might be. Okay, I'm getting lots of questions here. <laughs> um, Louise had a few unanswered questions. Yeah, I'm just gonna look at the, the note from Louise and then I'm gonna stop with questions for a bit because I'm getting a little overwhelmed here. <laughs> okay, so Louise's questions. Can you detect wind nerves in the neck um, are injured? Yep, that's called a cervical radic radiculopathy. As Donna has pointed out, we test for that using EMG, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. Um, to oversimplify, because of human anatomy, nerve conduction studies don't really test for problems of nerves in the neck. And uh, this nerve conduction study question about small and large fibers, hold on to that question. I will talk about that later in the talk. Okay, so moving on to EMG. What is EMG? Okay, so electromyography or EMG. This is a test that tests the functions of muscles and indirectly the nerves themselves and also indirectly the connection between the muscles and the nerves. So how does EMG work? So the EMG needle itself is an electrode. An electrode is just a fancy name for something that measures electrical activity. Oops. So the EMG needle goes into your muscle and it listens for electrical activity in your muscle. It, so we stick that needle into your muscle and listen to the electrical activity of your muscle. We do two things. We listen to your muscle when it's relaxed. We also listen to your muscle when it's moving. And there's different patterns of sounds that we hear when your muscle is re relaxed and when your muscle is moving. And those pattern of sounds, they tell us if something is going on with your nerves and your muscles. And again, I've used the word sound very specifically here because how the EMG machine works, the needle goes in, the needle listens to electrical signals, and then it turns those electrical signals into sound. And if you've ever had an EMG done, you'll know, because as you're sitting there getting poked by the physician, you're gonna hear lots of noise. And it almost just sounds like radio static. Uh, but that's kind of why I have to go to school for forever, is I have to learn how to differentiate between all the different noises that we hear when we stick a needle in your muscle. And those noises tell me whether or not the muscle and the nerve and the connection between the muscle and the nerve are working properly. So an electromyography or EMG test provides slightly different information from the nerve conduction study. So because we're getting different kinds of information, it allows us to better understand the health of your nerves. And as I mentioned in answering the question about cervical radiculopathy, because of how human anatomy works, EMG allows us to test muscles and nerves that nerve conduction studies can't reach. So, the muscle, so a, a good example of this is your biceps muscle. That's a muscle that you find over your arm. You know, you've all seen Popeye. Popeye has a big biceps muscle. That muscle is innervated by the C5 and C6 nerve roots. The C5 and C6 nerve roots, this is just an anatomy fact. You don't have to get too worried about this. They're difficult to test with nerve conduction studies. Nerve conduction studies can't really test C5, C6 nerves. So as a result, we use EMG to augment what a nerve conduction study tells us so that we can test C5 and C6 nerves. In terms of the equipment, when, it, when you go to get an EMG test done, 
like I said, there will be a needle which gets put into your muscles and that needle listens to the action of muscles both at rest and when moving. We then use electrodes, just like nerve conduction studies, these are just stickers and the stickers go on your body and they listen to electrical, electrochemical changes in your muscles and your nerves. And then we also have a computer which receives recordings from the electrodes and it presents all that recording, all that information to the physician in a readable format. In the case of EMG, it's largely just sound. We use sound to determine how well your muscles, nerves, and neuromuscular junctions are working. When you go to get an EMG test, what does it feel like? Well, again, just like a nerve conduction study, it starts with the physician cleaning your skin with alcohol. We then apply one or two stickers to your body near the muscle being studied. And then we'll stick a needle into the muscle being studied. And like I tell all my patients, because we're sticking a needle into your muscle, this will hurt. It kind of feels like a bee sting. And unfortunately, it's pretty normal for the muscle being studied to hurt for up to three days after the test. Now, while an EMG can hurt, when it's done properly by someone who's had adequate training, it shouldn't lead to serious injury. You might get a small, small injury like a bruise, but an EMG test doesn't really injure the muscles in any serious way. It doesn't injure the nerves in any serious way, although it does hurt. And like I said, we all have to get this done to ourselves in training. I had this done to myself and I really hated it. I didn't like it. It did hurt. And so when patients tell me this hurts, I get it. I know it does hurt. <laughs> and then in terms, once that needle's in there, what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is we listen to your muscle when it's relaxed. That gives us information about the muscle. We then get you to move your muscle. We listen to the muscle as it moves. And then we use those two sounds relaxed muscle sounds and moving muscle sounds to determine if there's any injury to the muscle, nerve, or the neuromuscular junction. In most cases, the physician will test multiple muscles. So that means multiple needle pokes all over your body. So that's kind of how an EMG works. So that allows us to fill in our what is electrodiagnostic testing chart a little bit more. So remember, when we do electrodiagnostic testing, we do a history and a physical examination. We then do some nerve conduction studies, which test the conduction velocity or how fast your nerve sends information and the amplitude or how much information your nerve sends. And then when we do electromyography or EMG, we're looking at your muscle activity at rest. We're listening, listening to your muscle activity with movement and we're testing the way the nerves talk to the muscles. So we're getting lots of different information about how your nerves, muscles and neuromuscular junctions are working. And so Linda just asked, what, in, what additional information is DMG giving over the nerve conduction study? Linda, I hope this answers your question. Uh, um, yeah, it, pretty much. <laughs> so it provides just a different kind of information for, um, for, yeah, for, for us physicians. Okay, I know we're kind of running low on time. I know everyone has lots of questions. So I'm going to run through repetitive nerve simulation really, really quickly. What is repetitive nerve simulation? It's the fourth, fourth thing that we test in EMG testing. Basically, repetitive nerve stimulation is just like nerve conductions, except we send many, many, many short pulses of electricity through a, through a single nerve in a short period of time. We have about 10 seconds to send tons of pulses through the nerves. And what we're trying to do is test the connection between the nerve and the muscle. When the nerve plugs into the muscle, there's a very special bit of anatomy there called the neuromuscular junction. I'm not going to go through that in detail today. It will bore your socks off. But basically, sometimes nerves get damaged along the length of them. That's called an axonal injury. Sometimes the myelin gets stripped off the nerve. That's called a demyelinating injury. But then there's this third category of injury, which is a neuromuscular junction injury. The real classic example of this is something called myasthenia gravis. And so how do we test for this? Well, we zap your nerve tons and tons of times in a short period of time. And we see how well your nerve can transmit lots of information in a short period of time. And that lets us understand how well this neuromuscular junction or where the nerve plugs into the muscle, that lets us understand how well that's working. So same equipment for a nerve conduction study. The only difference between a nerve conduction study and a repetitive nerve conduction study is that we send tons of jolts through one specific nerve in a short period of time, usually about 10 seconds. And again, while this is not dangerous for almost everyone, not just wimps like me, this test will hurt because we're sending tons of jolts of electricity through a single nerve in a short period of time. Doesn't damage the nerve, doesn't damage your muscles, doesn't damage the skin, but it is an unpleasant sensation. Okay, so now we've figured it all out. What is an electrodiagnostic test? Well, it's a series of tests that start with a history and physical examination. 
We then do some nerve conduction studies, which test how fast nerves send, send information, how much information we're sending. If we need to, we can do an electrode myography, which tests muscles at rest, it tests muscles with movement, and it tests the way the nerve, the word, the nerve talks to muscles. And then finally, if absolutely necessary, we can do oh, we can do a repetitive nerve stimulation, which tests the neuromuscular junction. That's the connection between the muscles and the nerves. I just want to emphasize that for the vast majority of my patients, I actually did the stats on this one day. I was interested in clinic, so 30% of my patients will get an EMG test. 100% of my patients get a history of physical examination and a nerve conduction study, but only 30% need the EMG. And for my repetitive nerve stimulation rates, I, I forget, I didn't do the stats on this one, but I think it's like one or 2%. So one out of every 100 or two out of every 100 patients that I see need a repetitive nerve stimulation test. Three out of every 10 need an EMG, but 10 out of 10 get a nerve conduction study and a physical examination. And we pile all this information together to understand how well your nerves are working. So, okay, I'm just going to go through a quick, a, a few questions really quickly here. What's the difference? Between, okay, Kamala, I love that question. That question has come up a lot, I promise. I know I keep saying we're going to get to it, but we are going to get to the difference between a small and a large fiber neuropathy. And then my neurologist says that there is no treatment when muscles are affected by nerve damage through CMT. Uh, so I would say uh, sort of, <laughs> what do I mean by sort of? So um, when specifically Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease, that's a disease of nerves. And so that means the nerves are not sending information to the muscles accurately. I would argue that the muscles in CMT are not damaged. The muscles are not turning on the way we want them to. So if you think of a nerve and a muscle, like a wire and a light bulb, the light bulb is the muscle, the wire is the nerve. In CMT, the wire is damaged, but not the light bulb. So theoretically, the light bulb can turn on. It's just not getting the electric signal from the nerve. So the number one way I treat muscle damage in CMT is, uh, is through exercise. Exercise works really, really well in strengthening the muscles that remain. And if the more we strengthen the muscles that are still plugged into, the better they'll function. Now, sometimes when people have really advanced CMT, we can those muscles aren't getting any information at all. And when the muscles aren't getting any information at all, unfortunately, we don't really have good treatments for that. I would agree with your neurologist there. So, and again, I'm a doctor, but I'm not your doctor. It really depends on how much damage your nerves have experienced as a result of your CMT. Medications like baclofen, which you mentioned, are actually prescribed for different conditions, something called spasticity. Uh, it can sometimes help with muscle pain in the context of CMT, but it's not a medication that I would prescribe specifically for CMT. But again, that's really kind of digging a little too deep into your own personal medical history without context. And so we, we, need, we need the context. We need to know you better. We need to know your nerve conduction studies before I can speak with authority about what medications make sense to, for you. Okay, I wanna talk about important limitations to electrodiagnostic testing because no test is perfect and EMG certainly does have some limitations. So key limitation number one, electrodiagnostic testing for the most part only tests the nerves in your arms and your legs. So that's the right side of our diagram. It's important for you to know because that means we cannot test the nerves that make up your brain and the nerves that make up your spinal cord. Sometimes people can have symptoms of a nerve injury because of damage to the brain or the spinal cord. The classic example of this is something called multiple sclerosis. When you come to see me at ANC, I cannot test the nerves in your brain and your spinal cord. So I can't test for something like multiple sclerosis. I can only test for damage to the nerves in the arms and the legs. So EMG is a test of the peripheral nervous system, but not the central nervous system. So sometimes you may have symptoms of a nerve injury. You may come to get a test done and the doctor may tell you it's normal. And that's because we're testing a part of the nervous system that isn't damaged. So that's key limitation number one to know about. Key limitation number two, and this is where we're gonna talk about small and large fiber nerves because I know everyone keeps asking. So electrodiagnostic, electrodiagnostic testing for the most part can only test myelinated nerves. Only the big nerves in your body are myelinated. 
we have many, many different types of nerves, which is what my diagram here is showing. And you can see that on the left of the diagram, we have all the myelinated nerves. So there's two kinds of myelinated nerves at a high level. There's motor myelinated nerves. So these are large fibromotor nerves and they control the muscles in, the, in your body. Then we have large fiber sensory nerves. These are nerves that do vibration sensation and position sensations, knowing where your joints are in space. These are the nerves I can test with my electrodiagnostic testing. There are lots of other kinds of nerves in the body. So small fiber sensory and autonomic. At a high level, small fiber sensory nerves test for, small fiber sensory nerves send information about pain and temperature to your brain. I cannot test these nerves. They're too tiny for me to test with my electrodiagnostic equipment. There's also these nerves called autonomic nerves. You can think of autonomic nerves as like the thermostat in your body. It controls blood pressure, it controls heart rate, it controls how much you sweat. It even controls things like sexual function. Autonomic nerves are very, very unmyelinated, tiny nerves. I cannot test autonomic nerves with my electrodiagnostic testing. There are specific diseases that only affect small fiber sensory nerves or only affect autonomic nerves. In routine electrodiagnostic testing, I cannot test these nerves. So again, you may have symptoms of a sensory neuropathy or an autonomic neuropathy. You may come to clinic and we may tell you that your electrodiagnostic testing is normal because we can't test the nerves that are affected in your case. Now, to be honest, when most people have a nerve injury, all five of these nerves that you see listed here will get affected. So I'll still be able to call the neuropathy because some of the myelinated nerves are affected. But there are some rare diseases where only these tiny nerves that I can't test get affected. And that's called a small fiber polyneuropathy. The most often, the most common causes of that is diabetes. Diabetes attacks the very tiny nerves first. So the small fiber sensory and the small fiber autonomic, and they may be your first symptoms but I won't see that on my electrodiagnostic test. All righty, limitation number three. Electrodiagnostic testing for the most part tells us if a nerve is damaged, but it doesn't tell us why a nerve is damaged. So often you'll come see me, I know I've recognized a couple names in this chat. I know patients that I've seen where I've done a test. I've said, you know what? I think there is a nerve damage here, but I'm not really sure why. So I'm gonna send you for extra testing. That extra testing is usually some kind of blood work or an MRI. And that extra testing can help us understand why you have nerve damage. So the electrodiagnostic test tells us whether or not there's nerve damage. It usually doesn't tell us why. We often have to do more tests to figure out why your nerves have been damaged. So that's a key limitation you should know. Even if there is changes on your nerve study, it doesn't guarantee that we'll be able to give you a firm answer as to why that's occurred in your first appointment. Okay, I'm looking at the time, guys, and unfortunately, we're going to have to skip this example. I talked too much. I apologize. I just want to go over some really quick practical points for electrodiagnostic studies. I think everybody should know this. So performing and understanding electrodiagnostic tests is a very specialized skill set. In Canada, doctors that do electrodiagnostic testing have completed a residency in either physiatry or neurology. So that's five years of training. Most of us then do a fellowship, which means extra training, and that's one or two more years of extra training. And we've passed two key exams, one exam for our core training program in either physiatry or neurology, and then a second exam in EMG. And so just because you're seeing a physiatrist or a neurologist doesn't mean you'll get an EMG done or an electrodiagnostic test done because not every physiatrist or neurologist has done training for electrodiagnostic testing. Only some of us had, have. We've done a lot of training to do it. So we've, we've been in school forever. <laughs> and that's to my point here. Even your family physician may not understand the details of an electrodiagnostic test or an EMG, and you know, that's okay. That's why specialists like me exist. I'm here to answer questions. I went to school forever so I can answer questions about it. Um, yeah, so it's a very specialized skill set. Not everybody has. It. And this is just a quick point for everyone on the call. Because it's such a specialized skill set, there aren't many of us out there, which means our wait lists are pretty long. So we, you know, first of all, we always apologize for that, but we see patients as quickly as we can. The only thing we ask of patients is that if you do have an EMG appointment and you can't make it, please let us know so that someone else can take your spot so that we can all work together to keep wait lists short. Uh, when we have patients that miss appointment slots, that's someone on the wait list who could have been seen. EMG appointments are pretty long. It's a pretty complicated test. 
for a really simple problem like carpal tunnel, I can probably see you in about 30 minutes, but for a more complex problem, it can take up to two hours. So if you're going for an EMG test, know that sometimes it can take a while to get through the whole thing. And then finally, um, because EMG is a specialized skill set, the medical school always asks me to have learners with me. That's why I'm a clinical assistant professor, whatever I am. <laughs> because there aren't many of me, I get asked to take medical students and I get asked to take residents and fellows. So if you come for an EMG, you may have you may see a learner as well as the physician. And that's just because there aren't many of us and we have to teach as well as practice. Okay, so that's all the things I was going to um, talk about today. I was just going to see if there's any quick um, questions that I can answer. And then I think we'll have to call it a day because I do have to go see some more patients in my clinic. <laughs> okay. What should we ask our GP if we think we should go this route? Angela, if you have nerve symptoms, the best thing you can do is describe them to your GP. So the big nerve, nerve symptoms we think about are numbness. So that's feeling kind of numb, a change in your sensation, not being able to feel things anymore, or weakness, not being able to move your body in the way you'd like. Tell your physician about any of those three symptoms and then ask them if they think nerve testing would be right for you. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll let you go because I know, like you say, you've got patients and you just get backed up if you keep talking to us. So <laughs> yeah. I, okay, we well, really appreciate your time today and thanks for everything. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your time today and I really appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to come join us. Thank so, you so much, Dr. Frost. And Donna and Jen. And Donna and Jen. Thank you so much.